uh, seminar this afternoon. I'm Jessica Young, one of, the, one of the graduate faculty here in our program, our Master's in Environmental Management. So thank you very much for coming. Um, I just, it's really a thrill to have Dr. Robert Murphy from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service come and speak to us today about his work with eagles. And it's always fun to invite a speaker that you first meet when they're kind of um, hanging up in a tree like this. <laughs> now I know you can't see 100%, but that was, Nate was in that area too. There's a tree very far. We had a chance, a couple of us, to go out. And um, Murph, as he is well known, Dr. Murphy loves to go up and do things with eagles right at their nest. Finds the trees, bags and brings them down and does stuff. And so I knew, given the nature of our community and our students, this is someone we have to come give us a seminar. <laughs> All right, the seminar today is Ranging Behavior, Survival, and Causes of Mortality of Golden Eagles in the Southern Rockies and Colorado Plateau regions. And I'm really looking forward to, to having work in this uh, uh, seminar today. I'll bring that Thanks. Up. What I remember from that nest, for some reason, I climbed with boot on one foot and I was barefoot on the other foot. <laughs> you remember that? I don't know why. <laughs> forgot, a, forgot a shoe that morning, I guess. But um, uh, this, is, this is just a side note, but um, it, it shows how incredible the technology we have today to uh, study birds. This golden eagle um, was trapped. Well, actually, this is the, the unique story of this, this bird. We were trapping, helping the university, New Mexico State University down here trap golden eagles during the winter. And they were having a tough time. And right in the area we were trapping, we were trying to catch overwintering birds. And this little country highway, somebody's driving along uh, on a February day and hits this eagle, smashes the windshield, 55, 60 miles an hour. They take it to a, a rehabilitation center not far from there. Um, no broken bones some soft tissue injuries maybe. A month later, it's flying around in their 100-foot long flight pen. We think, heck, let's put a transmitter on. We normally don't like to put transmitters on eagles that have been tainted by human hands. But we thought, what the heck? You know, it, it's, it's close to a trapped bird. So it was the 31st of March. Um, five days later, it was 150 miles north. About three weeks later, it crossed the 49th parallel. Look at this. That's the Rocky Mountains. Any relationship there? <laughs> so about five weeks later, here it is at Haines Junction, Alaska. A one-month stopover. Fuels up. I don't know if you know anything about Haines Junction, but a lot of salmon runs, dead salmon, probably stealing fish from bald eagles. 20 miles from the Beaufort Sea for the summer. 50 miles from Mexico. Right now, for th the third year in a row, it's just leaving Haines Junction. It's coming back. You know, so, and these patterns just, you know, they're identical. And you know, you'll see through this talk, um, you know, part of our, our need to understand golden eagles is just knowing where they come from. They're super, super mobile birds, you know, you know, obviously. So I wanted to show this bird because it's, it has a Facebook page. It has a fan club. <laughs> There's this long story about this Native American child that had a dream about this bird right before this happened. And it goes on and on. OK. So I was going to talk about survival, but there's so many interesting aspects about movement behavior, ranging behavior, that we'll focus on that. And I'll just touch on survival a little bit at the end and, and cause the mortality. Okay. Just want to acknowledge um, this is a really broad collaboration uh, project that uh, has gone on now for, for six years. The field effort ended last year. Um, certainly up in the southwestern part of the state, I'm, I'm really glad to be here with um, folks from the state who were able to help on this project. Okay, and I especially want to acknowledge the Blakemore brothers, flaming liberal, strong conservative, Traveling with them for five summers or five springs has been very interesting. But great climbers, uh, cliff climbers, they don't like to do the trees because you get halfway up and you find a, a big ant nest. And for some reason, they don't like that. But um, anyway, so just some background quick. You know, broad distribution, Golden Eagle, broad distribution in the Northern Hemisphere. 
in North America, the population that nests in the far north is highly migratory. You know, we have a pretty good idea of, of just like Thor, the bird I was just showing you, highly migratory. The population, the breeding population in here is believed to be um, semi-migratory, or I should say um, short distance migration. Or mig um, and the rest of these birds are, are thought to be sedentary, kind of stay in the pla same place year round. There's a small population that nests up in here and, and over winters um, in the eastern uh, states, close to the coast. Okay, just some basic background. Uh, golden eagles don't breed until they're five years old, occasionally um, at four years. Uh, so, you know, long period of, of maturation. Um, you know, they have big territories, about, say, 15, you know, 12, 15 square miles in an area like this where you have really high quality habitat. Somewhere in the Mojave Desert, you know, it might be more like 100 square miles. Okay, so during the winter, they spend a lot of time nest building during courtship and they they often have multiple nests and during that courtship period they'll be working on sometimes several nests and then they'll pick one and one tends to be a primary nest over over multiple years um, almost all the nests are in cliffs as far as we know um, typically two eggs are laid and here they would normally be laying in in february and their young would be uh, fledging uh, june maybe late July. Across the uh, Western North America, at least the Western US, you know, rabbits and hares of some kind are probably the most widespread important prey. Uh, otherwise, prairie dogs, where they exist, or some species of ground squirrels, in a higher elevations, marmots, you could throw marmots in there. But they eat a lot of different things, including um, birds as well. I won't talk much about survival, as I said. Um, you know, the, the rate, the percent of birds that survive from one year to the next is one of the most important pieces of information when you're trying to manage uh, populations of animals. Um, and it's surprising, I, I put California, but when we started this work, the only information, this is incredible, this is golden eagle, you know, one of the you know, apex predator in the West. <laughs> you know, when I started this work, I thought, ah, oh, geez, we must know everything about this. The only information we had on survival for golden eagles in the West came from there's a little spot in California called Altamont Wind Energy Site. If anybody's ever heard of that. That's all we had, you know, other than maybe trying to borrow from what the Europeans had done. Okay, so this is when I came back to the uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and this, I'll call it the Eagle Rule, but there was a big change in regulation. In a nutshell, our agency, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, um, was authorized to give permits to take, well, well you know, this is an odd word, take. Take means kill, disturb, destroy, injure, you know. Anyway, compromise an eagle in, in every way possible, or its young, its eggs, its nest, you know, so very broad. So we're authorized um, to give permits for take in limited situations. Um, you know, for example, emergencies. Say a reservoir was flooding and there's a bald eagle nest out there that's going to be flooded. So the local utility or whoever um, you know, might call and they ask for a permit for take. Native Americans, you know, some tribes you know, have a, a religious need for, for takes of, take of certain kinds. So those are high priority forms of take. Um, lots of others. But anyway, this is the important part. And this is what kind of differentiates um, the Eagle Rule from, say, the Endangered Species Act is that we're held to a high standard. You know, we have to be able to demonstrate when we give permits, say 50 permits across the southwest region in a given year, we have to be able to quantitatively demonstrate exactly what the impact is on the population. Okay. Because you know, this is our goal. We have to, we have to demonstrate that we're, if we're giving these permits out, you know, we have to somehow maintain stable or increasing breeding populations. We can't just say, oh, you know, we're going to maintain a healthy population. Not, nah, you know, qualitative doesn't cut it. Okay, we have to have numbers. They have to be defendable. So this, the science for this has to be very strong. And in 2009, it was not. You know, when we're called to court on things like this, we're in trouble. Okay. So here's where we were in 2009. 
you know, concern about golden eagles in the western U.S. Um, possibly decreasing in some regions. You know, we definitely could see local declines. You know, we know this is a, you know, case selected, meaning it, 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 there's a long period before it's sexually mature. Finally, when it's sexually mature, it reproduces very slowly. You know, what's an exa another example in North America? What could be more case selected than a California condor? You know, raising one young every two or three years. Okay, so these are just examples of the kind of information. Um, these are migration count sites, you know, where, they, where everybody who's a hawk nut in the country volunteers in the fall, spend their falls at these sites, and they count migrating raptors, you know, for some of these have been going on for 30 years. But anyway, so showing significant declines in the number of golden eagles passing through these sites. Um, just a, an early um, survey by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service suggesting a decline. So just information like this, cause of concern, uh, but also recognize we just don't have enough information. So meanwhile, this is the world we live on, live in, I'm sorry, um, in the western U.S. Think of golden eagles, you know, think first, you know, right off the bat, energy development, you know, all that encompasses wind energy, you know, gas and oil, power line transport, you know, um, just lots of threats to golden eagles, lead poisoning, you know, development. Um, so the scale of these is increasing, you know, think of solar and, and wind energy, you know, just phenomenal growth. Um, you know, we know a lot of things, we know a lot of things kill, can kill eagles, okay, so that's good. But what do we know about how important one is versus the other? Think, again, if you're going to manage a population of animals, this is important. Where are you going to put all your money, you know, your limited dollars? You know. Okay. Cumulative impacts. This is hard to get a handle on, but this word, or those two words, you know, you're familiar with here. Habitat loss is a huge, you know, indirect issue. Indirect, um, in some cases, causing indirect mortality. And, um, again... We just really don't know much about the species. So enough for introduction. Okay. Recognizing our, our lack of knowledge and our need to make big decisions in quanti you know, some quantitative way, we, we started a project. This was a pilot project in the southwest region. Um, and the idea was initially we would start a pilot here, we would learn some things, and then we would help out other regions where um, golden eagles are a particular concern. So this is what we call a bird conservation region in the, the U.S. North America's broken into these bird conservation regions. And basically, it's a physiological region of some sort. So this one's called the Southern Rockies and Colorado Plateau. Um, and we think that bird communities have um, things in, you know, in this area have a, you know, a lot of things in common. There are, there are certain characteristics that are um, predictable. Um, so this, as I mentioned, we had a five-year effort here. Um, these are nest sites. Almost all of our satellite telemetry work was done with nestling golden eagles because we wanted to follow eagles um, through those five years into breeding age, ideally. Um, you notice that this isn't exactly randomly distributed. <laughs> um, amazingly, we did some work over here in Utah and Almost no nest sites were known for southeastern Utah. And um, Dale Stolicker, a couple of you know him, last year he went out for a couple days and surveyed this in a, in a Super Cub an airplane and found 43 nests. You know, pretty amazing. You know, this area, we did a lot of work, but a lot of birds were dying at fledging in the few months after fledging. Severe drought, severe drought, poor food conditions. So uh, the Arizona Game and Fish helped us out and did a little work over there. Okay, so the one thing about the telemetry methods we're using, you know, they address a dozen major questions, objectives. Um, these are the most important ones. The red ones are the ones I wanted to focus on today, so mostly on movement. But, you know, we're making assumptions up front about what's a population? You know, how do you define population? How do you separate one population from the next? This is important when you think about impacts. 
think about birds moving, a mobile species. Just because it's in New Mexico and or in the Four Corners region where there's really not a lot of energy industry like there is in other parts of the country, doesn't mean it's secure there, okay? So there's, there's just so much about populations that can be understood with telemetry. This, this, this factor or this term right here, natal dispersal, you might not be f familiar with, but all that means is the distance from where you were born or where you hatched from an egg to where you ultimately reach breeding age, where you are when you're bre you know, for an eagle um, five years old. Um, and that also is a really important aspect of, po of um, population dynamics because knowing how far birds move from their place of birth to where they breed is how you can begin to distinguish different populations. Sorry about that. That's a, that's a no-no. Okay. So th this is what I'm going to focus on today, just these red ones. Um, this again, areas of high importance. If you're, you know, if you have concerns over a resource, you want, want to know places where it's most vulnerable. The distribution of, of the areas that are, are most important to that species through its annual life cycle. Okay, so this just some examples of um, the habitat throughout the Four Corners region. Some might recognize this. It's only about 30 miles southeast of here. Um, the Hickory Apache Nation. It's pretty much what it looks like. Far north, uh, western New Mexico on the Navajo. And this is what the, the very arid part of our study area looked like. Uh, they had also on the Navajo. Okay, so this, can you see this well enough? Is that, okay, so that's, that's a satellite transmitter, also known as a PTT or platform ter transmitter terminal. Um, it weighs about two ounces. You know, just incredible technology in about two, this actually goes back to the 80s, but in, in 2007, they were able to add GPS technology to this. You know, every hour, we can tell where these eagles are within 20 meters, you know, basically within the size of this room. You know, it's just amazing. And it has a little solar module right there uh, that recharges the battery. Manufactured um, guarantee is three plus years. We have now a couple of them going into their fifth and sixth years. Okay, so I'm just gonna revisit the, these, these main objectives. Okay, um, what, Ornithology 101? Okay, so this is a uh, migration. Here's a couple of migration paths. Okay, here's where a bird spends part, part of the year, other part of the year. Okay, so where does the bird nest and raise its young, and where does it spend the winter? This is north, this is south. No brainer, huh? Come on! What did my genetics professor say? Come on, stick your neck out. Okay. Everybody knows the answer to that, obviously. <laughs> so we'll go on. Okay, so this is one of the, going back to this basic question about population mixing. Okay, here's a population. We, you know, years ago, we are, everybody knew that this is a sedentary population. Golden eagles don't migrate, you know, down here in these states. Right off the bat, we have a northward summer migration. You know, never documented anywhere in the world for the species. You know, half the birds in some years, half of these, these juvenile, sub-adults, and now even adults that fail to breed, they move north for the summer. Okay, so this is um, 2013. I just pulled uh, a year from here. Um, these white dots are, some of these birds have two-part summer ranges, especially the first year. But this is the mecca of golden eagles. Not only does Wyoming have an incredibly high breeding population, we already know that it's important for golden eagles from Alaska and the Yukon that in recent years have been tracked by satellite telemetry. And now we have these birds from the four corners moving here as well. So um, Wyoming, South Central Montana, this part of Idaho, you know, Utah right here. I mean, just, uh, I have, you know, we have five years of data like this now and you can just see, you know, we've, we've documented 36 migration cycles 
You know, it's incredible. So th this is that same year. Okay, this is the middle of winter. Um, 12, let's see, 12 golden eagles that weren't migrants and 10 that were migrants. So if you look in the middle of winter, all 22 of those, those red areas are where they're concentrating their activity in the Four Corners region. And when you look in the middle of summer in July, you know, here's, here's the, the uh, distribution activity of those 22 birds, half of them being in places north. Okay, so just a couple of qu uh, quick aspects about this migration. Uh, the timing, it's quite variable, but um, in the spring, you know, May, early June, these birds are moving north. Um, it, it, it's in the fall, late summer, fall, where it varies quite a bit. You know, some birds leaving at the beginning of August, you know, and some um, not returning till um, almost November. Okay, and these, big, these are big distances. We're not talking, you know, 50 miles. Okay, we're talking some big distances. You know, some of these migrations all the way to the, the 49th parallel, to the um, you know, edge of, of Saskatchewan. Okay, a couple things here um, that are to point out. That's a lot of miles. That's about what, 11, 1,100 miles, 1,700 kilometers. A lot of variation. Again, you know, it takes them a long time. This is the this is that late spring, early summer migration, and and part of this is because these first year birds, the first migration they make, as I'll show you, you know their path is uncertain. They're going northwards. But they're exploring, as birds do. That's, you know, they, they learn as they go. And they're exploring all the way along, and they're doing stopovers. It takes them a long time. But it, that changes when they come back, OK? You know, half the distance, almost half the time. OK, this shows us even better. Here's an example. Here's a bird now we've tracked. I don't have it on here. She just returned, her fifth year, fifth migration. OK. This is what I want to point out, though. This is typical. The red would be her first northward migration. You see, she's, you know, she's exploring Colorado. You know, she's up into the Black Hills, the South Dakota Badlands. You know, she settles here north of Laramie, and then later in the summer, she settles down here. OK, that's, that's that you know, 15 days, 1,700 kilometers, you know, that long distance. OK, here's a return. You know, she can do that in two and a half days, no problem. Okay, let's go to the next year. A little bit of wandering. Okay, let's go to the yellow. I mean, can you get it much more direct than that? You know, so this, you, you see this again and again, the consistent patterns, you know, the fidelity, the faith to these migration routes, they get tighter and tighter. Okay, so this is that bird again I just wanted to show. Um, these are the, you know, what we call the core areas, the areas of most concentrated activity. So again, the blue is that first year. Okay, that's the first part of the summer and the second part of the summer. You know, south, north of Lermery, uh, south of Lermery, Lermery Plains. You can see the fall through sp spring, and you know, she had her um, concentrated use areas, her core areas were kind of spread out. Now, she hones this, okay. The red is the next year, okay. The yellow is the next year. The purple is the next year. So, I mean, this is the kind of, and she, meanwhile, interestingly enough, her, her range the, the rest of the year gets tighter and tighter. So you see this pattern again. This isn't wandering. You know, all these birds go north. You know, they don't go south and west. You know, we call those dispersals. We have lots of birds that go to Mexico. You know, um, I'll, show, I'll show you some of those. Okay, this is an example of a stopover site. About a third of the birds do this. It's always on the late spring migration. They don't do it on the way home. Again, they're faster when they come back. You know, they spend two to four weeks at some place like that. And here's a bird, two years in a row, using the same stop oversight. Again, you know, familiarity is everything. So I just want to make it clear. All these birds that migrate do so at the beginning of the second year. Okay, so, so they think about this. They hatch generally about mid-April, okay, and they stay close to home or they disperse. But anyway, just after April, when they're becoming, when they're entering their second year, that's when they migrate. These, none of these birds do this in their first year. They all do it their second year. You know, some that migrate the second year might not do it the third or fourth year. That varies. 
Okay, this is that other objective, one of the other objectives, you know, identifying important areas. And, you know, think of the energy industry, think of wind energy, you know, think of impacts. You know, these are the um, now 36 migration cycles. You know, we can identify these corridors. These blue tracks are some of those initial, those first spring migrations of some of those juveniles. You know, you look, we just looked at this one. You know, but after they make that one, they, they get it together and they're not wasting time or energy. We have the Wasatch Front, backside of the Rockies, and the front, and the San Juans. Okay. So, why? I shouldn't have put these in there. I shouldn't have loaded this. But, okay. So why would they do this? Just, <laughs> why would they do this? Well, I'm a northerner. It's good to be a little further north today. Lived most of my life on the edge, on the edge of Saskatchewan and North Dakota. But so heat stress could be one. And, and here's, here's a piece of evidence. OK, of those birds that don't migrate, about a third of them, almost half, have this behavior. OK, so this is July. Here's a high elevation valley that's full of prairie dogs. This is the Sangre de Cristos, the, the, the south, the terminal part of the, the Sangres in um, New Mexico. You know, this is one month. That's about 3,300 foot elevation gain over just a couple miles. The birds eating prairie dogs, and the rest of the time it's going up to, you know, what? I don't know, 13,000 feet, almost. So why? That to me suggests that th there's a thermal regulation aspect to this. Okay. So what about this bird? Okay, let's think about prey avail availability. I showed you that southwest part of the study area, severe, severe drought, northeastern Arizona and adjoining, severe drought, very little prey, nothing to eat. It makes sense that those juveniles, if they're lucky enough to survive the fledging period, you know, they'd get the heck out of there and find some place where there's some food. Okay, so here's a bird from Gunnison. It's a bird we call Cathedral. You guys are probably familiar with this one. Okay, now why would this bird migrate? What better place can there be to live than in Gunnison, Colorado? <laughs> right? I mean, this place is incredible for, the, I mean, I've not spent much time here, but the golden eagle density, the, the abundance of prairie dogs, you know, it's just incredible. So this bird leaves this area. You know, what's up with that? It goes up to here. You know, there aren't more prairie dogs up there than, than there are in Gunnison. So then you ask, okay, well, if that's the case, and the density of breeders here is so high, you know, this could be a territorial issue. You know, you've got a young bird, young dumb bird, squeezed in between these territories. The adults no longer want them the second year. They've got other kids they're raising, okay? So it could be pressure from local breeders. I don't know. Okay, so implications of this. Just right off the bat, all these birds go into Wyoming. You know, incredible numbers of prairie dogs here. That's what's attracting them. Okay, all these little dots, there's about 7,000 GPS locations here, and this is, what, 16, I think 16 eagles represented collectively over a five-year period here. But the red is um, wind energy and planned, that's, that's up and running and, and planned for the next uh, four to five years. So we find that places that are really great for golden eagles tend to be also great for, for wind energy. And we're finding, too, that, that golden eagles are, are incredibly vulnerable, more than any other bird we know, to mortality at wind energy sites, blade strike mortality. Um, so this is a really important uh, area for golden eagles and also for wind energy development. And, and it answers that question, you know, when we're trying to deal with um, part of our, uh, the Fish and Wildlife Service is trying to find ways to uh, work with the industry to uh, design wind energy projects and place them in places where um, you know, they won't be such a threat. Uh, you know, this information is really crucial. You know, these aren't just birds from Alaska or you know, they're birds from the Four Corners. You know, 
You think the Navajo or the Hopi aren't concerned about this? Okay, so the other thing is that, hey, what we were thinking, you know, up front were, would be good management units to, try, you know, think about a management unit. We've got permits. We've got to decide, okay, we're going to let it, you know, we're going to give this many permits for this area. You know, how do you make those decisions? You know, is this, you know, here's, a, here's an area on the map, this, this bird conservation region. You know, do those birds all stay there? Or if we take 50 birds, are we going to create a sink? Okay, just really basic, straightforward questions, you know. So here, right now, we're, this, this piece is one of the ones that mo is motivating us to change the way we look at uh, eagle management units. Okay, just, there, there are a lot of other things we can think of, but we've started a late summer survey that covers 80% of the Western U.S. It costs $350,000 a year. You know, and we're trying to, we're, we thought that that's the time of year when, all birds are sedentary. Either they're just, you know, they're just fledging. They're, you know, nobody's migrating, moving around. Hey, guess what? Half the juveniles and subadults from the Four Corners are up in Wyoming. So anyway, just um, you know, lots of things to think about. Okay, this is the second part of this movement, um, ranging behavior piece that I wanted to cover. So out of those 83 eagles that we've marked, we have 58 birds that we were able to follow through the first year of life and 33 to the second. Anyway, um, all the way up to now uh, the fifth year of life. And I'm going to just show you examples of, of dispersal. Again, what we want to try to understand is the relationship between where these birds are raised, you know, where they hatch, and where ultimately they nest. Okay, are they moving across several states to become part of a breeding population way over here? Again, that's really important when we talk about removing animals from the population. You know, are we creating a sink condition over here? So we want to understand too what happens in those intervening years. You know, during the subadult. Okay, we're golden eagle experts. If you just read the literature from 2002, everybody knows that golden eagles just wander all over the you know western U.S. for those three or four years, right? Okay, um, you know, so they're really vulnerable to mortality, say, in Oregon or Hawaii. I just want to see if you're paying attention. Okay, so this is, this is what we're finding. Okay, I, I've, I've named these two dispersal strategies, and I'm talking here, first year dispersal mainly. What do they do in the first year when they leave the nest? You know, do they stay within a mile of the nest? When the, that adult pair is starting to court and build a nest and lay eggs during the winter, you know, those adults aren't going to go for it. They're, they, those young are going to leave. You know, when do they leave? You know, how far do they go? Where do they go? So we found that most of these birds stay within about 70 miles of home in their first year. You know, we call them home buddies. It's a surprise. Um, if you look at the literature, there's no dispersal information for the whole southwestern third of the U.S. And just because it's drier down here, everybody figures that they move across several states. But that's not the case. Okay, and then we have this other strategy we call the big movers. You know, so out of those 58, 10 of them moved up to 1,400 kilometers. I'll show you this. You know, several of them into, you know, well into Mexico, all over the place. You know, eight of the 10 um, died. Okay, dangerous strategy. And the others, you know, we don't have time, we don't have time to show you, look at this, but um, just some really incredible things you would never imagine. Um, so here's an example of a homebody. Okay, there's the nest, a little red, that's a core area. Um, at three months, you know, the bird's fledging, being fed, it's gonna stay tight here. Okay, this is at seven months, so here's um, late fall, would it be October into November? Okay, staying within about a mile. Some nights even spending the night on the cliff ledge, 20 meters from its nest, you know, being fed by the parents or putting up with it. Well, guess what happens, you know, by March? Okay, courtship happens. Uh, this pair raised two the following year. You know, they're not going to deal with a youngster screaming there, begging for food all day. Okay, so this is pretty typical. You know, first year dispersal. 
what's that, 60 kilometers or so. So then the next question is, well, what does this, what does this mean for ultimate, the ultimate natal dispersal? So now that's what we're tracking, and that's the next question. Okay, so this is the other, op the other end of the spectrum. This is a big mover. Okay, um, this bird came from a nest on the Navajo Nation right here. Again, that's th three months of age. Okay, so it'd be late August. Late August. It made. Can you see these little black dots? Each one of those is a GPS fix. So those, that dot and that dot, is an hour apart. Okay, so this is late August. I mean, this is just like a, just like a six-year-old. You know, makes this big loop back home. A week later. Oklahoma City, the suburbs, in 13 days. You know, it's 1,300 kilometers, but the total distance, distance was closer to 1,800. Okay, okay so this is that, that late fall um, core area. Okay, started out in Oklahoma City. A month later, it's shifting south and then spends the rest of that month in Dallas-Fort Worth. I mean, in Dallas-Fort Worth. I was at the Fish and Wildlife Service office down there a couple months ago, and I went out to see where this bird had been. It was a mile from their office. <laughs> Did you think any of them saw a golden eagle? And no. Anyway, so this is how these birds get themselves in trouble. It's, so here, now we're going into March. So this bird's wandering, goes into Arkansas, and you can see how it, it, these are all, this is a 80% courier. This isn't really a, a tight courier. It's a little looser, but you can see the more concentrated activity being dispersed as this bird's moving back west. And I bet you a dollar, this is uh, the end of March right here, it was electrocuted on a power pole in an oil and gas field, but I bet you a dollar a week later it would have been within 60 kilometers of home. But they, you know, this is the problem with being a, a, you know, a risk taker. Okay, just a couple other um, slides to help with this. So. I'm going to focus on the Gunnison area birds. Um, actually, this is the tree that I think, yeah, this is it. Okay, there, there are twins here. Um, we call this the stub nest area. Um, okay, so this is first year, and this is typical for home bunny. So this, I, I want this to, um, I want to use these figures to illustrate this. So that's the hatch date. Ignore these. Those are Julian dates. Okay. And that's kilometers from the nest. There's 200. Okay, so figure about 120 miles. Okay, so this is the fledging date, and we use a systematic way to, an objective way to determine fledging. We did it like the Europeans did. Anyway, so this is this is that fledging move. See this little blip right there? That's that little that's that little loop up here. Boom! It fledged, and it didn't return. Notice it doesn't return. You know, to the nest here. Okay. So that's this move right here, steady, steady, steady. And you wouldn't pick this up if you didn't have this, but it, you know, it has a split area of concentration. Okay. But anyway, 60, 70 kilometers, home buddy, the bird's still here. You know, if, we, if I downloaded data today, that bird is right here. And I bet you three years from now, he won't be far from there when he nests. Okay, here's the sibling. This is the other stubs bird. Okay, dispersed about the same day, two days apart, left that area. Okay, you notice the scale is a little different here. That's the San Luis Valley. Okay, so Stubbs 1, we just looked at was what? Right in here. Okay, this is a sibling. Big mover. Look at this. Okay. At the nest, at the nest, at the nest. Boom! Okay, so that's this move in about a week. Something about Dallas-Fort Worth, it was almost there. Loop back, and it settled here for the winter. It's, you know, probably the, the last big concentration of prairie dogs in Texas. Okay, so two siblings, completely different story. This one dies, okay. That's where that ends. Electrocuted, 
however. Okay, so just a couple more of these because these are really cool. Okay, this is the bird that we looked at before that, you know, did all those migrations. So here we have four years. Okay, so here's that big loop up into, into uh, South Dakota, Black Hills, and down. Okay, there's a dispersal, you know, close to home, close to home. Okay, that's th these loops right there. And that big spike is that one right here. Okay, settles, settles here, and then shifts down you know, closer to home. So that's that bump there. Okay, so it returns home fast. This is the following um, fall, winter, spring, you know, before it migrates again. So before I showed you how those couriers were kind of spread apart, you know, that's that movement back and forth, kind of erratic. Second year, a little more steady. Notice on the summer range, you know, much shorter period. Look at this. I mean, how can you possibly be more faithful, more steady to a seasonal range. You know, three, we're talking three seasons. Look at this too. Birds get older, they stay up in the summer range for a shorter period of time. This year, she was only there two weeks. Why would that be? One, two, three, four, five. I want to be, I don't want to go north. I want to be back where I can compete for a nest site. Okay, and this is the other bird with the, the stopover. Okay, same thing. Look at that. I mean, these birds are going up to Wyoming. You know, here's, this is the stopover. Boom, there's stopover, stays there for a while, into Wyoming. Second year, boom, stopover. Okay, what the heck? What, what's that? It flatlines. Right, you know, I mean, what's going on with this? This is what's going on. 60 kilometers from the place this bird hatched, it finds the honey hole of prairie dogs. Okay, this is northeast of Cortez. It spends, for months on end, three quarters of its time on one of these three transmission towers. In one square mile, I mean, I'm talking months and months and months in one square mile. Can there possibly be enough prairie dogs there to feed an eagle for 18 months? I mean, through the winter? The answer to that is no. This lucky bird found an older male. And I don't know what happened to his former, but she lucked out and bred as a fourth year bird this year and produced a kid. Just, you know, amazing. So that's what I'm tying this back to what I was, my, my thoughts about that five-year-old bird, you know, not wanting to be far from um, home. Okay, so just the last couple things on, um, this is the, the Gunnison Canyon bird marked in 2013. Again, not far from here. She is like, okay, the, oh, you know, here's, here's one of the ultimate home buddies. You know, and, and she's in this area with this, you know, what I believe to be probably a pretty incredible eagle uh, nesting density. There's probably sub-adults, there's, you know, and here she is, you know, hanging on here somehow and obviously doing well. So she's going to have a tough time a couple years from now competing for a nest site. Okay, so this is just the last piece of, um, that I wanted to talk about, the third uh, objective here, uh, sources of mortality. And I want to point out that these are verified causes of mortality. So these are birds, almost all of these have been sent in for necropsy. You know, some of these electrocutions are, are really obvious. But um, we also have, what I don't mention here, is that we have a lot of mortality that goes on during the fledging period and, and the first one, two, three months after fledging. And you know, sometimes we know it's some combination of starvation and um, infection, but most of the time those are unknowns. So we have a lot of mortality going on in that early period. So this is just the birds that we had, you know, verified uh, cause mortality. So they tend to be, you know, birds that are older than um, six months old. But, you know, electrocution clearly, you know, this is something that we suspected for a long time our Division of Law Enforcement bases on all the cases they make. They, 
they're guessing that 800, 900 golden eagles are killed by electrocution a year. And um, you know, this supports that. This is a surprise. You know, this is, this is something out of the 60s. You know, that still, there's that much persecution. And it's not just in one place. I mean, this is all the way from down by the, the Mexico border to Craig, Colorado. You know, just, so anyway, these are older birds that you know, have a problem with starvation infection, some combination. We don't know which comes first. You know, collisions of all sorts. You know, um, you know, one of them, Nate, the bird you picked up last year, you know, we believe was a collision while hunting. Um, cranial contusion and, and, and bleeding. Anyway, poisoning, that's mainly rodenticide. One was a laced carcass, so mountain lion, that one was uh, in Colorado. Okay. So in summary, these are the, the take home messages. Four Corners Golden Eagles. Got this northward migration, it's significant and it's predictable. Wyoming, really important area for these birds. Prairie dogs, just incredible importance of prairie dogs to the species. Is, I haven't really touched now, I could show you a lot more, but just incredibly important to golden eagles. Okay, we need to rethink our ideas about eagle management units and how we allocate take permits and such. Um, okay, dispersal. Most of these birds are home buddies. I didn't go past the first year, but I'll just say that that pattern we see the first year you know, definitely tells, foretells what's coming in those the sub subsequent years. Big movers die, our sample size is relatively small, however. Um, so what, what's important here, what we're seeing is that as we move on now, we're, we're, we have birds entering that adult age, is that the natal dispersal distance here is probably much shorter than anybody would have thought, okay? And, and so what that means is that if you have an area where you have a lot of mortality going on and you rely on birds coming, dispersing, coming in from you know, adjoining areas, it's not gonna, there's not a very big area around your sink that's going to help rescue or, or um, fulfill those or fill those niches, those um, vacant territories. Okay? So it's really important in, in terms of population management. Okay. Yeah, and the last one is power line electrocution. Um, you know, major, I, and I distinguish here, the you know, man-caused um, mortality factor. And so one piece that we're doing right now is that we've started, we started after this, we started these other um, regional projects up. And now, including the work that was done uh, before this in Alaska, we have a total of 450 golden eagles in Western North America that have been followed by satellite telemetry. And we're, we're doing a meta-analysis right now and that the first one we're doing is causes of mortality. And guess what? Electrocution rises to the top. That's it. <laughs> Isn't that the most awesome picture you've ever seen in your life? <laughs> a friend of mine took that. I'll pay a thousand dollars for that. Yes. So where would that's a really good question because um, we don't know at this point relative to the other causes. It's hard to estimate because the sampling is the sampling of wind energy sites at this point is it's the scale of it is, is too small. But Wyoming, for example, you know we we have a high concentration of, of Golden Eagles and, and a lot of women have developed. And, uh, I mean, we know of more than a hundred, and most, you know, most of those are found not by through surveys, but people who are just working at the sites right around. I mean, yeah, we just don't know. That's a that's a million dollar question, you know. And, and uh, but probably it doesn't, you know, if you put all the wind energy together today, think about places where wind energy is cited. What we're trying to do to avoid the, the worst case sighting, um, it probably still pales compared to electrocution. I mean, and, and part of that is just, we'll get into this, to this a little bit tomorrow, but now we know more about survival, we know more about production, about population size. And if you, if you take that simple model 
and you add, you know, increased um, amounts of wind energy mortality to that, the population wouldn't show the relative stability it's showing right now. So now, just in our region, we're transitioning right now from 28,000 to 40,000 turbines in a five-year period. So, and this is just the beginning of turbines. Yeah. So it it could change. Sorry, what region is that? You said our. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. The southwest region. I'm the southwest region of fish monsters. So that that's at the Colorado line, but the region Colorado is Wyoming. It's right behind it. Highest, highest rate of, you always hear about California in terms of number of turbines. Yeah, the, the Rockies, Dakotas, Kansas, Oklahoma, Texas. Yeah, just substantial in the next, next 15 years. Huge transmission product, products going into Curia. It's, um, so they could change the picture. Yes. Yeah, so but wind turbines use those transmission lines, right? So it doesn't matter like what's being used for energy. It's, they're going to get electrocuted out of the way, and especially if there's more that's a really good point. Because transmission lines aren't a problem. I should have mentioned that. Transmission lines are not a problem from a standpoint of electrocution. It's the distribution lines. Yep, those are the ones that, and if you learn just a little bit about what kills birds on power lines, and you drive around, you, you know, right away, instead of looking at the senior thing, that's a killer. That's a killer. And you come by three weeks later, and there's a very well data coming. Yeah, it's the distribution lines. The transmission lines, you know, an issue there might be collision, you know, relatively, relatively minor. Plus, of course, in some places, Golden's build nests on transmission towers, where there aren't other nest substrates. Yes? Uh, what is the difference between the transmission and distribution lines? Um, what, what it's, it's pretty basic. Um, so, got a, an insulator there, an insulator there, and an insulator here. Okay. These are called phases, the conductors, and one's a ground. All the bird has to do is touch the land here and touch part of its body here and here at the same time. And that's the simplest case. You go to a place where you get a transformer, you got the jumpers, you know, there's wires all over, they're not covered, I mean, the bird's going to get killed. It, 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 it won't get killed probably if it just touches its, its distal feathers. It has to touch the, the hand, basically. You know, two parts of the body, it's either a phase or to a ground or a phase to a phase. You know, it's electrocuted. Yes? Has there been any noted like, correlation, like increase in, in uh, golden eagles <coughs> being on power lines because of the, like, the clear cutting under them? which might give them better viewing of rabbits or bird dogs or whatever? Yeah, there's, there's, definitely, um, there's definitely evidence. Does that question ever come up with regards to sage grouse? <laughs> yeah, I mean, that, that's an example where it's a concern. You know, places of wide open landscapes historically, all of a sudden, you're, you know, you're, you're throwing in all these perches, these hunting perches. And it, um, it definitely creates more hunting opportunities. It's not that golden eagles don't hunt on the wing a lot, but you know, the red tail hawks are, or great hunters, are, those are great perch and weight hunters. And, and golden eagles will do that too. And that definitely, you know, both gives them a, a big advantage. Um, I can show you some examples. But it also puts some of the prey at a disadvantage. Something like sage grouse didn't evolve with power poles across the landscape. Neither did less of prairie chickens. You know, we can't stand birds. Yes. So is that keeping the populations like in the population Oh, that's a question. I'll defer to Dr. Young on that. Um. Boy, that's a tough. Like depends on what predator and prey relationship we're talking about, I suppose. But okay. it is. Let's get together for a week and we'll bounce it over. <laughs> yes? Of these um, whole body birds, uh, do you know what's the likelihood that their 
parents would still be around when they're five years old and come back to the same relative area to breed? Do you have data on that? A high probability, very high probability. You know, the, of all the raptors in North America, I mean, and, I mean, obviously part of that's because these birds live to 30 plus years in the wild sometimes. Mm -hmm. you know, they, they have really strong, really strong mate fidelity and, and site fidelity. You know, they almost never switch sites or switch mates. That would be most unusual. If they do, it's because one of them died. They're just, I mean, I'm talking, this isn't like well documented all over North America, but it is pretty well in Europe. And, you know, it's like 90% chance. It's almost, their survival rate of adults is about 90%. And fidelity to the site is almost the same as survival rate. So do you, is it known then if there's any mate choice discrimination that, you know, you wouldn't, you wouldn't breed with a sib from two years ago? They don't care about that. Because I mean, uh, there are big kid raptors. clusters, really. Uh, that. Do you mean because? Do you mean because it's because it's a genetically related bird? Is that why you're asking? Well, because if if you come home to okay. breed, who are you gonna mate with? It yeah. could be a, a sib, a last year's sib, a blah 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 yeah, blah. In, so in do the you last get ten, in the last ten years, I mean, going back golden eagles, the information on inbreeding in raptors has there's. There's been a lot that's come to light. It's very common and because exactly what you're saying. Because you know, birds tend to be site faithful. They tend to be faithful to the home. They tend to be faithful to their breeding territories. Yeah, and that happens. Yeah. So let's get together a couple couple more years and we'll look and see where some of these birds end up. You know, we already you know we just looked at one today. We have two more this year that are going to they're going to do it too. I'm sure. So. Yes. Work with uh, years ago with Morgan Nelson's work with power lines and stuff. Is, is that is that kind of uh, not as valid as we thought it was, or are you know, power lines changing, or are power companies just not following guidelines? Or do you know? Morley Nelson's work at Snake River Birds of Prey, or that's where he's associated with. Um, you know, it clearly was the foundation of what we call now the Avian Power Line Interaction Committee. It's a you know, huge collaboration by industry, biologists to try to reduce electrocutions. And if you look back in the 70s, you know, just the basic, these you know, really fundamental relationships. You know, if you look at the common distribution line, like 80 to 90% of the electrocutions are occurring right here. And, and just what he did with, you know, Aware, the awareness he created with this issue is, you know, you know it, he laid the foundation by far. Now, what's happened since then, because of that awareness, there's been a lot of advances in in um, protection gear, you know, to you know, insulators on jumpers, you know, this big rubber thing on that. Um, you see these perch guards sometimes on poles. You know, a couple of years ago, a paper was published in the Journal of Wildlife Management. You know, they found that these are really ineffective. You know, still get electrocution. Sometimes we're still building nests on them. Ravens, at least. But, yeah, but the advances in protective gear and the effectiveness of those in the last 10 years, it's just, there's just been so, you know, major advances. But the problem is we have 10 million miles of power lines, you know, to cover and um, you get small local utilities, it's expensive. You know, so they're chipping away bit by bit. Um, but they're big players. Five years ago, the Service One Fish and Wildlife Service, a $10 million civil suit, a settlement with Pacific Corp because they weren't keeping up with their what we call retrofit, fixing these problems. So, you know, bit by bit. Um, Tripping away at it, but we, you know, this is a problem. We just need more support, infusion dollars, and that goes to the customers. And yeah, people don't like that. Mm -hmm. Yes? Uh, during the duration of the project, was there any mention of airspace for various habitat and maybe reducing the electrocution problem? Um, 
No, I'm not sure I understand your question. I mean, we, we, do, we can measure airspace use. I'm just wondering if anyone is discussing the, the theory of maybe using the airspace in regards to habitat like that, you know, place where animals live and breed and protecting that. Yes. Has anyone talked about that? We're going to like go across state borders and Yes, I could um, if you stick around, if you have time, I'll show you a couple slides of a new technology that will just blow you away. But it does exactly that. I mean, it gives you precise airspace use all day long you know, on these birds. And you can relate it to siting utilities, you know, anything that's relevant. Yep. Yeah. So we have it on, on these birds, but it's course level. You know, it's plus or minus 20 meters, but the vertical actually is not is that it's not as accurate as they say. The horizontal is. Yes. We've had a lot of fires in western part of the United States. How does that affect the migration pattern of these three birds? It's a good question. The, the the one I can think of was was it three years ago in Colorado, um, west of Fort Collins, what was the name of the fire? All the way up and went into the Wyoming area. Um, that area, two of our birds moved there and they just sat on that area for months after the fire went through, because obviously some things were made vulnerable. But, you know, beyond that, I don't know. I don't know. The bird migration this year in Colorado has been very weak, fall migration. And I'm talking about as well. Is that perhaps a great long term of I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I think you have to think about that and probably refer to some of my colleagues on that too. And think about what species, you know, will be end of orbits. Well, it makes sense that they would be, I mean, think about Canada. Good question. Uh, Let's go ahead and thank Dr. Murphy again, and then please stay around if you have some additional questions and so forth. If you'd like to show us a little bit about the other space. <laughs>